going to try and do here. Um, I'm going to try to awaken the room to a term I could use called reality. I think there's a reality in, in early stage and early operating companies that we just need to talk about straight. Right? So it's going to be a, you're going to love this conversation or hate it, and I don't care. Right? The point is, I hope something lands. When I'm around used guys and used gals all the time. Right? So that's the first thing. Secondly, we're just going to not do that again. Um, we're going to talk about products and services. I have a saying, if I go to mentor you and you talk about your product or your service, you're fired. I don't want to hear about it. If it doesn't work, we shouldn't even be talking. But don't talk to me about product and service. It's not important in the bigger story. And I'll get there. The other piece is, I say, if you have your talk, the most successful companies have good management or great management. That's, that's just, we could just put a period there and I could step off the stage. Right? So we want to get the point through that leadership is my number one concern in the tech industry. And the reason I can say that is this is, this is what I do. Just take a second to read that. So my exposure is pretty high. So you can listen or you don't have to. But I'm around, I'm around organizations like yours all day long. And in real time, I have been doing this for a number of years since I retired. The, the key thing I just want to point to you is that what I've noticed is a lack of leadership is the fundamental reason why you don't succeed. It's just fundamental. And, and that's why the product's not important. I have seen companies with rocket science product years ahead, and they completely face plant because the CEO or the founder isn't willing to lead, or can't lead, or, or a combination of the above, right? And the second thing is, the, the two challenges that I put together is many Vancouver and the Lower Mainland and kind of British Columbia is known as an R&D shop by the way, people in the States and the rest of the world. We, are, we build great technology, but we couldn't get it in the marketplace on average very often. So we're seen as a tech shop, right? So I think those are two assets to start a company. Being technically wired and having domain expertise I think is an asset, but it quickly becomes neutral and then becomes a liability. And we'll talk about that. Right? And I see this a lot. And the way that I mentor is I'm shocked and awe because you guys don't listen, you guys and gals don't listen that well. Right? Because as founders, you believe, in many cases, that you know what you need to know, and I'm saying that's not true. So we'll talk about that. Um, and then appreciating leadership. I had one company come to me and say, I want, I have 11 employees, and I want them all to decide on everything together. And my response was, I'll check back with you in six months. If you're still around, we'll talk. Because that's insanity. But his view was, you know what, I'm tired of this little leadership structure thing, and I don't want to be a boss. And, but you know what, that's just, that's irresponsible. So eventually, he figured it out, and he stepped aside, and the CEO was replaced. Because he wasn't interested in being the CEO. That's good. That was a really good decision, and the company's thriving. And so, the other thing I've noticed is, I can't believe this still exists. This is like 70 stuff. There's 2,500 different applications online for accounting. They get differentiated on sport. It's not going to be your product. But your product has to be table stakes. But it's going to be the way that you market it, the way you position it, the way your company's structured. And I still see people saying, no, no, no. I'm going to raise some money and blow my product out. I'm going to add all these features. Okay. Are you going to get that information from the market? No, we know what the market needs. We're going to lead. And uh, so I see that a lot. The mousetrap days. Sorry. Now, this is different. I use a term called customer intimacy. I love the word intimacy. And, and that, I don't see that a lot. But when I meet companies that have, and I'm working with a couple of companies right now, where their customer intimacy is, the customer will say to them, you know us and where we're going better than we do. That's customer intimacy. That's because they've done their homework. They're well-led. Their team is deep in the marketplace. They're telling the customer a lot. If they create a new feature, it's because either a customer's going to pay for it and it applies to the market, or they've done their research. They don't just create features because they've got developers they need to keep busy. So that's another key piece, product market fit. And that's a real concern for me because I see a lot of really great market opportunities and the product market fit is not going to happen because your organization is poorly bad. 
R&D is seen as this technical thing. I don't see it that way at all. I see it as a, an act of leadership. Because where do I invest my R? What does R even look like? What percentage of my organization is R? Do I need any R? Maybe I just restrain D and I'll run them. Like that, to me, the R&D conversation is an act of good leadership to figure out where it fits in the marketplace. Are your competitors R&D centric? Are they research centric? Are there, is, there, is there technology, the, the core patent and trade secret stuff better than yours? And do you care? I've, I've competed in marketplaces where my product was a third of theirs and our business was four times theirs. Because our market intimacy was better, our operations were better, our sales and marketing were way better than theirs. And our product was good enough. So R&D is one where I get a lot of people saying, we're going to invest a lot in R&D, and my response is always the same. Why? And then if you don't do, I love that Carl came before me. Carl and I are all time friends, so this is good. If you don't have sales and marketing, you should just stop. And give the money back to your family or investors, and go get a job. Because if you don't respect that sales and marketing is the differentiator in the marketplace, a great product with no sales and marketing sits on a shelf, it's just shelf work. So I, I'm around the sales and marketing conversation a lot because it's absent. It's absent in your mind, it's absent in your priorities, it's absent in your spend, it's absent in your boards. And so I can tell you that sales and marketing is, it's the new must have. It's the new superfood, right? So, last what I noticed. And this is really interesting, it goes to what, what was said before. I have a saying, and that is, the right person in the wrong role fails every time. And the analogy I use is, is Wayne Gretzky, that's just who he is. At the peak of his, of his career, when he's scoring 100 goals a year, his coach goes, right defenseman has been injured, you're doing right defense. Gretzky's like, fine. And then second period, the coach is like, what? what's wrong with Gretzky? The guy is a loser on defense. Like, they're getting right past him, he doesn't get it. And so the concept is, why would you put the right person in the wrong role? And you folks do it all the time. Mainly because your roles are awful. <laughs> I get roles sent to me, I want to hire a director of marketing, or I want to hire somebody, and I look at the role and go, I can't imagine anybody can succeed in this role. They, they, they're not going to succeed, so you're going to hire a perfect person. And then the other thing I hear from founders is, we've churned through that role four times. <laughs> and I look at the role and go, no, you just put four good people to a slow, painful death. Right? <laughs> Roles are so important, and because they're so hard work, and they take discipline, because you can't even know what you expect, you don't do them. And I just see this so often, right? And then mandate. Mandate tells me, in this role, this is what your fingers around my neck expect. I have to deliver this. So your employees often don't know, you don't even know what the role is. And they don't even know what you expect from it. And then it, when you do their annual review, you say to them, I'm disappointed with your results this year. But what you should have said is, I'm a horrendous manager, and you lost a year because of me. <laughs> but I don't hear that said very often. So I'm just going to be really straight with you, because I'm just around this conversation a lot. Roles are everything. And then I think the other thing is, it leads to a lack of accountability. So I'm in this company in, in, in Victoria to make this amazing software product. They do about five million a year, and they've got 11 people, first of all, that was the first concern. There's 50 people, 11 in the leadership team, we'll talk about that. So I said, other than the leadership crisis, when you do new product releases, who owns that? And they negotiated in real time in front of me. Dad's like, well, we kind of own this part, and, and marketing's like, no, 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 we have so, so you're actually telling me that you're always late in getting your products to market, and you don't know why. And I just want you to know that because you don't have roles set up, I'll bet nobody actually gets up in the morning and thinks about this product touching customers first. And nobody does. The roles are wrong, and you can, so there's nobody accountable for it. Yet they're surprised that they're always late. I mean, yeah. A little bit about infrastructure. So when you start off, yes, you wear 21 hats. You need to shed them as fast as possible and get roles defined. So when I talk about infrastructure, I see people who are, think when I run a company, I want accounting to drop financials in front of me four days after the month end. So I'm running blind for four days. I don't know what happened in the previous month. I can guess, but I shouldn't be guessing. I have companies I work with who get their financial reportings every six months or annually when the accountant goes here to your year. 
So I say to them, so for that entire year, you flew totally blind. There's things called mountains, lakes, low tree, tall trees, and you fly blind, and they don't get it. Financial visibility is how you fly the thing. So that's basic infrastructure, good accounting, CRM. How can you not know where your customers are, or, or where they fit, or who's who in the hood? And so CRM is another very basic, you don't need to spend a lot of money, but if you're going to build a sales model, you need some, you need some basic infrastructure. There's some really good online stuff that's cheap. Please don't wait. And then I'm a big fan of what I call One Page Planner EOS. And that is a structure. It's a tool. It is not going to solve your problems. But it'll help you with cadence. It'll get your machine going faster. It'll help you with focus. It'll help you with accountability and responsibility. You will have a one-year goal, a three-year goal, a ten-year goal. How many of you in this room have a one, three, and ten-year goal that's clear to the whole staff? That's pretty good. The rest of you. <laughs> Sorry, this is the biggest concern I have. So when I meet companies, when I used to be hired as a, as a uh, hired gun CEO, I would ask the board if I could meet the employee, the leadership team, and they always go, whoa. So why can I not do that? That's insanity. I need to know what, who's on the bus already and who thinks they're running the bus. Yeah. Second thing is I have noticed that leadership teams are this funny term. So I'll meet companies and, and I'll say, so tell me about your leadership team. Well, we have two co-founders and, uh, and we have seven employees and we have, um, we have four people on the leadership team. So you have five people on four on the leadership team. Who's accountable for revenue? Well, we both share. Who's accountable for finance? Well, no one is. Who's accountable for uh, product development and all that piece? Well, all of us are. That's not a leadership team. I'm not sure what that is. Leaders have very clear accountability. I use the Jewish term, fingers around your neck. I work for this big company. I just love the thought of having fingers around your neck of accountability. And so leadership team is my number one concern and why the tech community doesn't strive, doesn't meet its goals. We have such potential in this province, and we don't because we don't take leadership seriously. Oh, so, a little game. This is called the CEO acronym, and it doesn't mean chief executive officer. I've assigned three words for each of the letters, and we're going to see how you do. What do you think the C stands for? Captain Terry. No? Captain Terry. No, not competency. Critical. No. 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 Isn't that interesting? Who do you notice about that line? What's underlined? Yeah, it's the thing you don't want to do. And founders only do what they want to do, which is why they fail. A CEO will do what he or she must do. You know what? You had a co-founder with me for two for two and a half or three years. This is not working out. You need to leave. And I'm going to work it out legally with you. Or that market, that's a failure. We're stopping. Or that product is a failure, we're stopping. Or, you know what, we're going to focus on one market versus 12. Or, I'm going to hire someone smarter than me to run finance. That, those are must-do things. And founders, sorry, will do what they're comfortable with. And that is a giant limitation in your business. That's the first thing. What do you think the E means? Execute. Okay, no? Evolve. What's that? No, not evolve. Makes sense. No. Aspects. Pardon me? Expect. No. Uh. Sorry, you're it. You're it. You, as the founder and CEO, you are it. I noticed that when my battery went low, the whole thing came down. I'm around startups all the time where I love Carl's comment if you're not taking care of yourself, then you're actually hurting the whole company. I've been in organizations where the CEO has said to me, I am so tired. And I'm saying, you have to tell me, we can see it. <laughs> it is visible to your employees, it's visible to your customers, it's definitely visible to your board. So I just think that you need to know that as, the, as energy, you need to be responsible for who you are as the leader. And we'll talk about what you do with your time next, but it's so important to know that you're the energizer bunny in the company. And if it has to pivot, you need to drive it. If it needs to stop doing something, you need to drive it. If it needs to go through 
laying off half the staff to survive, you need to drive it. So that's just the good and bad to use of the E. We think you know me. Organization. No? Officers. Was that? Officers. No? Ownership. Was that? Ownership. No? This, this is all for founders. You should groan when you see this. So founders start organizations based on passion and subjectivity. This feels good. I love this. This is really good. The sooner you can put a bullet in that stuff, the more successful you are. Because CEOs make decisions like that market is, we're bleeding cash here, shut it down. Well, that's, the, that's our hottest market, wind it down. We're bleeding cash here. That's, a, that's an objective decision. Not, I feel really good, I love that market, I love the companies we work with, and we're bleeding cash. What's wrong with that story? Because there's no data in the decision. Objectivity is a data-based decision-making process. The sooner you as a founder can get to making decisions based on data, and I don't mean terabytes of data. Sometimes you only have a kilobyte of data to work with, but it's better than how you feel. I've had CEOs call me on Monday morning saying, I feel really good about where we're going. My response is, back it up. Tell me why you feel good about it, because feeling good is irrelevant to me. Because I've seen you feel good about those 11 bad decisions. So this is a really important thing for you, right? You've got to get the emotion out. Keep it where it's important. Keep it where it's needed, but please take it out of the business. It's so destructive. And this is probably the number one coaching thing I do, is if you want to call me and vent on me, fine. But keep it out of the company, because it's just, it doesn't work in there. $10,000 rule. So my mentor uh, used to be the, was the CFO of Hertz Rental Cars. He was a heavy hitter, right? And he was an organizational genius. And he said to me, I noticed, because I have an engineering background, he said, I noticed that you have a tendency to fixate on details. Let me just tell you that what you spent this week on was valued at a buck a decision. I need you making $10,000 decisions. So I need you to start measuring your day and your hour. So I had a sticker on my computer for years that said, $10,000 per hour. And I would look up and I'd be doing something that was just not close to that. And eventually, I had to wake up to the fact that I was attracted to things I like to do, that I wasn't making a hard decision. So, what you do is, this is, this is instruction, this is homework. Put a sticker on your computer that says $10,000 an hour. And then check it throughout the day. And then what you'll notice is, you very seldom do $10,000 hour decisions. And isn't it interesting that the vision is missing? And the values are missing? And market focus isn't really terrific. And the product roadmap's not finished. And you've got some higher fire decisions to make. Those are all $10,000 an hour decisions. But what you might be doing is signing the checks because getting an account is a pain in the ass. 10,000 signing checks is not 10,000 bucks an hour. That's monkeys on typewriter stuff. So this is a big one. I see this one a lot. It's very concerning why I see this one. Because it's the number one reason why I fire a Because if you can't get to the point where you're thinking that if I make this decision, I could add a million to the top line. If I make a really bad decision, I could strip a million off the top line. That's the way you need to think. Because if you're not making big decisions, then nobody is. And I can tell you, that's what I see all day long. Not good big decisions. So, get skills training. I'm part of the ASTEC organization, and we are training people on marketing, culture, finance, sales. Sales is a killer in the tech industry. It's just a killer. Sales and marketing together are the places where they die, right? Because, and I'm not asking you to become an accountant or a marketing person or a salesperson, but how can you hire a salesperson if you don't know what the job is? How can you write a role? How can you sell it to your board? How can you sell it to yourself? So, I mean, I think the key thing here is just get skills training. Find a mentor. And I think there's lots of mentors in this city who would love to help you out. I charge a lot for what I do. Some of them do, some of them don't. I still do volunteer work. But get someone who can say to you, that's a really bad decision, you probably don't want to do that, right? Or, why don't you think of it this way? Or what I said to somebody on the phone yesterday was, you know what, I think that's a good decision, but I think you need to take a couple of days and think about it. Because it's a big one, and you're moving too fast.
very subtle guidance, right? Get a mentor. It's the smartest thing I do. And I love this one because I always have people say to me, oh, you know, I, I, I've got a great leadership team. I'm like, no, you don't. And then they hire someone amazing. And they come back and go, you know, I cannot believe the impact that one person has had on my business. So hire someone amazing. They're not technical. They're way smarter than you are. And they have domain expertise. Maybe they're an amazing salesperson or a marketing person or operate that power. It doesn't matter. Just hire somebody amazing and spend too much on them. Because I've, I've had people say, I want to hire a VP of sales. I'm thinking of sixty to seventy thousand a year. And then I convince them to pay one twenty, and they say to me six months later, Wow. Yeah, you want to be wowed by your leadership team and your employees, right? And then you, you need an accountability system. Sorry to do. As much as I love founders and I do, you guys really suck at this. Your, your teams aren't accountable. A, they don't know what they're supposed to do. You don't know what they're supposed to do it by. You don't know what the priorities are, and neither do you. So, as a CEO, we fail. So, accountability systems are terrific. How was that for a sprint, huh? <laughs> Questions? I can wait for all the yes, David. Um, what's the difference between what a mentor would do and so the question is, what's, what's between a mentor and a board? Well, one of the reasons why I say mentors is because most of these people don't want boards because they don't understand how boards work. I've, I've put the board as number two. I fought that fight for seven years, right? Most, most people don't want to give up control or they're afraid and they don't realize. So there's this whole thing that boards are scary and terrifying. A good board can make a huge difference. A mentor starts like right away, like tomorrow. It could take you two years to get a board figured out. But I do have a big supporter of boards. So in ASTEC, which has 120 companies, 84% of them don't have boards. That sucks. That's, that's bad news. It's not good news. It's bad news. So I say mentors because they're going on board tomorrow. Yes, get a board. Questions? Sorry. Yeah. Go ahead, buddy. Well, in the past, I've uh, tried to hire people to do the smaller tasks like virtual assistant, social media manager, and all that kind of stuff. And uh, one of the things that I frequently run into is when I'm interviewing people and I'm checking their, you know, other reviews and things like that, um, they seem really great and they can talk the big talk. But when I hire them, they can't deliver on anything. And then literally, three to six months later, I have to fire them, like, sorry. Like, I have a business to run, like, something as simple as taking a week to make a flyer that would take me 15 minutes to make, okay. you know? And I'm wondering what I could be doing wrong in the hiring process to be picking people that are not delivering. So start with the role. Mm -hmm. uh, if I have trouble with an employee, I don't look at the employee, I don't nail Sally or go after Steve, I figure out if they're a role broken. Is this an unworkable role? And then I make sure I can clear on my expect objectives and, and milestones and all different pieces that help, help me know what to produce. And then I pay more than I'm comfortable to pay. And, and I, I'm trained to talk rating. There's a program called Talk Rating. Read the book. So I'm a certified talk rater. Because in 1980, 1993, I worked for a company with a 65% churn rate. And how do you fix that? You learn how to be a better recruiter. So you need to learn to recruit. That's a skill set. Skill set. So top rating is a great book to read. It'll change how you interview. Top rating? Top rating. Because yeah. to me, one of the very concerns is if you have the role right, and you have the compensation right, and you have everything structured, and you don't know how to recruit, you're dead. That's one of, it doesn't matter which leg is missing, it still falls over. Right? Mm -hmm. Yes, over here? I just had a question. I keep hearing, uh, get a mentor, get a mentor, but then I don't know how to go about getting a mentor. Finding anybody. That's easy. How you do it? <laughs> you just tell your community I want a mentor. It's amazing. I get I get I get emails probably two or three a month saying I want a mentor, and all I do is say thanks. It's money, and I just let my network know. And sure enough, somebody comes up. There's people looking to participate. Because remember, the great thing about a mentor is I don't have any fiduciary exposure. You can fully face plant not that I want you to, and I don't I don't have any on me. So I get to invest, invest, invest without all that hair that goes with being in a business, right? It's a wonderful job. There's lots of people looking. So it's literally mentors in you. You just need to find a way to meet each other. Did you say 
Yeah, destroy your community and looking for a vendor. It's amazing. Yes? Yes? Yeah, I just wanted to throw in your accountability um, comment there and, and boards. Yes. That's a board's role. Is it accountability is. to the executive board. That's why they're there and that's why they're there. Which is why most founders don't want them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, thank you. Yes? Seems like it's, it's a bit of a challenge uh, balancing those three words, courage, energy, and, and uh, objectivity, because uh, sometimes you, know, you don't have all the information in order to, but you have to be forward with courage. And, yeah. You know, so, so, uh, the energy and emotional pieces is, is uh, you know, it's hard to bring that to the organization while also wanting all, only the facts all the time, right? So it, it seems like a bit of a challenge is there, is there any place on that. Uh, so I'm, I'm not sure I get your, is there a question then? I, I'm just, I guess I'm just making an observation and just, so, so, I mean, to me, courage courage is that you are willing to make a decision with the best data possible, not how you feel, which is, oh, let's do or die. Energy means you just need to power the thing. But you, if, if, what I've noticed is some companies will say to me, you know, my ener the, the organization is kind of lacking energy. My response is, really? Do you realize how flat you are as a CEO? You walk in the door looking like you don't want to be there. And then you walk around looking like you hate everybody. <laughs> so, like, light the place up. Have some fun, right? And so I do see that. And I know it's hard times, but that's why I call it the, that's why I picked E, because lighting up a business is freaking hard work. But you have to know the only one that can power it is you. And if you know that, then you, I used to, my wife would say, change your face. Because I wake up in the morning, I would be able to wake up in the morning face, she's like, you should change your face. Because if you walk in with that, it's not going to be used now. Yes? So um, another question along the same lines in terms of um, hiring a mentor or hiring a business coach. Mm -hmm. Are there any red flags we should look for and how do we know that the coach that we have hired or retained or you know, a mentor is doing their job to get us where we want to and we're not just wasting our money with someone who's not going to get us where Yeah, I mean, I think a red flag is some people are going to hate this. If they ask for equity, that's a bad thing. Okay. They're not only around for period of time, so why would we get equity? And equity looks bad on your tax structure when you go to raise money and it's like, who is this person? Are they mentoring you for three months? Now they have 1% of your company? It's not good. So that's a flag for me, and some mentors have told me that's a stupid comment, but no well. And then, and then the, other one is, the other one is just that you have to set goals to objectives, and then, like, if you and I agree those goals to objectives, I'll get you there. But you know what they are. And you better be prepared for me to push and pull and drag. And that's the other side. If a mentor is kind of not engaged, <coughs> anyone else before we go? Other One more? One more question. This is worth 10,000 bucks, folks. <laughs> <laughs> we all done.